Hello there, Drew Handish of Whiskey Lore, and today I have some whiskey in my glass. I'm going to be sipping on it, but I'm actually going to be talking a little bit about MGP. Now, we've all talked about MGP. Usually the thing that you mention about MGP is, yeah, they make all the juice for all the startups, and so that's what they are all about. And we a lot of people who know a lot about whiskey will say MGP puts out really good products. But a lot of people talk about MGP. I wonder how many people actually know the backstory of MGP and their distillery. Well, the distillery was recently rebranded as Ross and Squibb. And those names are important to the history of Lawrenceburg. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. Now, Lawrenceburg, Indiana, is right on the Ohio River. It is between Cincinnati and Louisville, closer to Cincinnati. It's right across from where the old Petersburg distillery was, which I actually went out, and there is a sign, a historic sign for the Petersburg distillery. But it was one of the victims of the Whiskey Trust. It was a big, grand distillery, and they didn't want the competition. So they bought it, and they shut it down. And so, gone to history, all that's left is the house where the distiller lived and the rest of the place where the distillery was is just a big field. Well, straight across from them is Lawrenceburg, Indiana. And Lawrenceburg was the site of three distilleries pre-Prohibition. And two of those distilleries are part of this Ross and Squibb name and um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about that. But let's also talk about where MGP is right now. MGP has this distillery pumping a lot of different juice out. They have certain formulas that they use. And this gets in uh, things. Uh, they especially make rise. Rise are big for MGP because a lot of distilleries don't want to make rise. They're very difficult to work with. I was at Pennington Distillery, they were working on rye whiskey, and I asked the distiller, you know, what do you think of working with rye? The eyes rolled. It expands when it's, uh, when it's fermenting, so it becomes a bit of a messy affair, and it's not, just not the same as working with corn whiskey. So a lot of distilleries, George Dickel's a good example, will go to MGP and utilize their juice instead of messing up their own equipment with rye whiskey. Templeton rye, that's another one that comes out of there. I started going through my shelf trying to figure out which whiskeys that I had that are actually MGP, and I don't have many. I had Big Nose Kate at one point, which has part of it from MGP, I had, um, I've never had Smooth Ambler, that comes out of there. Penelope, which is the one that I'm going to be going out to an event tonight and talking about MGP history and also doing a tasting of four of their whiskeys. That was made by MGP, and now MGP has actually purchased the brand. So they are going to have that as one of their in-house brands. And they also make Rossville Union, which that name will come up here in just a moment as we start talking through the history. And they make George Remus. And they sell that themselves. But then Angel's Envy, they get their juice. Uh, They're making their own whiskey on site. But they started out with MGP Juice. And James E. Pepper is another great example of that. Uh, Widow Jane, some of their juice is from Indiana. You can always tell. It'll see, say, made in Indiana. Uh, people will sometimes say, oh, MGP, eh, whatever. MGP has a long history. This is not a distillery that's a Johnny-come-lately. Although, I will say, MGP, in terms of their ownership of the Lawrenceburg distilleries, that is fairly new. MGP, the company, goes all the way back to 1941, uh, but it wasn't until the purchase in 2011 of the distillery in Lawrenceburg that they have now become what they are. Now, if you go on to Wikipedia and you read about MGP, they talk about a distillery. And I got really confused as I started doing my own research into it because I saw the name Shinley as who purchased the distillery. 
And then I saw in there that it said Seagram's. So I've started doing a lot of reading and I realized that there are two distilleries that were really close to each other. One was at Second in Maine, the other one was over by the railroad and very close to each other, line of sight. And one was the Squibb Distillery, had the Squibb origins, the other one was the one that had the Ross origins. So we gotta go all the way back to 1846 when a man named George Ross was a brewer and he had a partnership with another brewer. It was Ross and Ebert and the partnership dissolved and Ross went into making whiskey. And so not a lot of information about what the distillery was at that point. Back then, they didn't always have names for distilleries. You just say that's the distillery that George Ross owns or whatever it may be. There was a George Ross company. And then in 1874, uh, and this, as uh, far as I know, this is after George Ross died, the company or the distillery then was finally named Rossville. Now, I'm trying to research all this, it gets very confusing because there is actually a Rossville, Indiana. And I started looking, I'm like, is this, what was this in Rossville, Indiana? No, it was named after the man who was the inspiration, the, the spot that this distillery was built, that, that was his distillery. So they called it Rossville Distillery and that name apparently went all the way up until Prohibition. Now, at that point, uh, if you look at the website, you will find that the Ross and Squibb website, it gets a little muddy in there too, in terms of how it's talking through these transitions, which means it probably needs to be a little bit more deeper study into this. There was a time period when the Whiskey Trust was buying up a lot of distilleries. Was there any interaction during this time? I don't know. But we get into Prohibition, and this is where the George Remus story comes in, because George Remus apparently bought into the distillery, and then the stories start happening that, and this was all about George Remus, he was the king of the bootleggers. What he would do, he's an ex-lawyer, he knew all the games, and so, actually he's still a lawyer at that time, knew all the games, and so what he did was he set up this scheme where he would have a distillery or a warehouse that he owned. He would ship the whiskey out on trucks. He would have hijackers that would hijack the whiskey, and then he would make his profits off of the hijacked whiskey. So now you've lost your, your whiskey. Now you can sell this bootlegged whiskey. It was a crazy scheme. He got caught doing it, but it went on for a while. He came out of the gates firing with this system um, and like I say, he knew how to, to work the system at that time. Ended up getting Jack Daniels, uh, Lem Motlow into a lot of trouble because uh, the two of them shook hands uh, during a deal that went down where Lem was trying to sell the St. Louis Jack Daniels stock to, he didn't know, he was selling it to somebody from back east Come to find out that George Remus was involved in the deal because he was the attorney for one of the men who was making the purchase. And so it became a whole big thing. I talk about it in my Tennessee Whiskey History book when that comes out. You get to read all about that really interesting time in Jack Daniels history. But Remus was a character. Remus actually ended up it's interesting, he had to spend some time in the Atlanta Penitentiary, and while he was in the Atlanta Penitentiary, his wife was supposed to be handling things. Well, Imogene was a hottie, apparently, and she liked to be the lady about town, and she got involved with a revenue agent, and the two of them started scheming, and when he got out of prison, she asked for a divorce, and this, the, the taunting went on for quite a while afterwards. He ends up gunning her down in the street and then claims insanity, is his own attorney, 
and is basically freed of all the charges. It's just 1920s, crazy, crazy time. And so that's the, that's the story of George Remus, really. He's a really interesting guy, and he's tied to some uh, other distilleries like Old Pogue as well and some of the warehouses in Kentucky that were consolidated and him getting involved in those. Anyway, I'm way off the track with MGP, but like I say, and Lawrenceburg is right there, not far from Remus's home base of Cincinnati. Death Valley was the name of his uh, compound that he had there. Um, what happens after that is that coming out of Prohibition, there was a time period for a very short time that they made industrial alcohol there and then they got ramped up and were purchased by Seagram's. Canadian whiskey, he was coming in. Uh, uh, Bromfell, uh, Sam Bromfell, he was a bootlegger in his day with his brothers and then went legit when Prohibition was over and decided to end up purchasing some distilleries. He bought a few distilleries and in fact Four Roses Distillery now was one of the distilleries he bought the Prentice Old Prentice Distillery and Athertonville and some others so this was Seagram's the basically Four Roses their recipes that we talk about those yeast strains that's when he started collecting the yeast strains and so Lawrenceburg was one of the distilleries that was purchased as well and it was called the Rossville Union Distillery at that time. So you'll see there's a Rossville whiskey out now, and that is basically coming out of Ross and Squibb. So we go through, after a while, it's sold off to Pernod Ricard, and it goes to another company, and then it ends up uh, in 2011 with MGP. So this is the distillery that is now the Ross and Squibb Distillery. So we got this name Squibb, and we're going, well, where the heck does this Squibb name come in? Well, he does get mentioned on the website a bit, and you'll also see his name around in other places. And of course, his name is on the actual distillery now. But he was not associated with the Rossville distillery. He had another distillery that was within eyesight uh, in Lawrenceburg. And as I said, there were three distilleries there at one point, pre-Prohibition. And he got involved with his brother in a distillery in Aurora, which is a town south of there, and then they decided to build this big distillery in 1869 in Lawrenceburg. And that is where he got into a partnership with a guy named Cosmo Frederick. Love that name. And so it was Squibb and Frederick for a little while. And then when Frederick left a couple of years later, it became the W.B. Squibb Distillery, even though his name was W.P. Squibb. So... I don't know how that happened, but anyway, that's the way it went. Uh, they made Rock Castle Rye there. They made Old Dearborn. Dearborn. I, I grew up in Detroit, so it's Dearborn. Uh, Dearborn. I hear it pronounced in many different ways. Anyway, um, that's what he made there and some other whiskeys as well. But there was a flood in Lawrenceburg in 1913. It was a pretty devastating flood. The owners ended up both, I think, dying at that time. I, I have not researched that enough to, don't hold me to that, but that's what I've read from other historians. So we're putting 1913 as a date when that distillery probably burned down uh, or, or um, was uh, damaged by that flood and then they rebuilt a new distillery. Well, Kentucky goes into Prohibition five years later and now all of a sudden, what are you gonna do with this distillery? Well, coming out of Prohibition, Shinley, which was one of the big companies, was looking for a distillery. And so Shinley comes along out of New York and they end up buying the old, what's now known as the, uh, or what they turned into the old Quaker distillery. Because old Quaker was a whiskey trust brand that ended up falling into the lap of Shinley and then Shinley reintroduced Old Quaker, and I found a newspaper article. It's really interesting because as a baseball fan with a lot of citrus, I, rye is just so interesting to me. Uh, lemony notes and that rye, herbally rye note in there as well. A little caramel, 
This is the uh, James E. Pepper 1776, by the way. That's kind of an old bottle. I've had that for probably three years. So lots of oxidizing going on in this particular uh, whiskey. But I found an article that was kind of funny because this is a baseball fan when the Cleveland Guardians, I still can't get used to that name, uh, moving from Cleveland Indians. And of course, we talk about the Kansas City Chiefs and uh, all of that, you know, should those names be changed, whatever. It was interesting because there was actually an argument back in the 1940s about why are all these people using Quaker? <laughs> the Quaker people are not happy about all this use of um, Quaker in brands. And funny side story, many years ago when we used to just look at the internet for fun instead of actually productivity, I saw this site that said, Answer this survey, and it will tell you what religion you probably best identify with. And I took the survey. I came out and said, Quaker. <laughs> and so I had to read up on Quakers and go, oh, okay, this is what Quakers are. Um, apparently the name comes from it, the gathering. Basically, if somebody feels they have something, they've been hit with the Spirit of the Lord, they can just blurt out whatever the heck it is that they are feeling at that particular moment. And that's where they got the name Quaker. And one of my favorite generals in the American Revolutionary War was a Quaker, Nathaniel Green. Interesting thing about Quakers is that they're pacifists. And so how do you have a general who basically helped us win the American Revolutionary War? <laughs> how do you have a guy like that all of a sudden become great military leader, but he was able to put his religion aside and get the job done. And then he retired. Should have been a nice, he got Greenville, Tennessee named after himself. So you have all this random trivia I can throw at you. He had Greenville, Tennessee and Greenville County, Tennessee named after him. And then he died of sunstroke. Crazy. All right. So <laughs> this is where we're at. Anyway, MGP, this is the whole story of MGP. Basically, at some point, though, the old Quaker distillery, don't know what happened to it, it um, but the property, I believe, was acquired by MGP, and so it is part of the campus now, but it was, I don't know that there's still a distillery there. Someday I gotta make a journey up there and check this place out. In 2011, MGP bought Luxco, and Luxco is the company that um, has the license or that um, basically had the name Yellowstone. And so that gives them ties to the Limestone Branch Distillery. And then if you talk about like Rebel Yell, which is now just Rebel or Ezra Brooks, all of those names are now basically MGP brands because they are under the umbrella of MGP, but yet they are made in Kentucky, in Bardstown. So this is the other thing is that distilleries are being purchased that aren't necessarily in Lawrenceburg that are under the MGP umbrella. That is the story of MGP. It's long, it's thick, uh, but I've said for a long time, and I really wanted to dig into this because I've known that it has a long history. I've known that that history potentially went back into the 1840s, but it wasn't MGP at that time. It's just that MGP bought those particular uh, distilleries, their plots of land, their facilities. And so that is the tie back to the 1800s. It was basically the modern version of MGP started in, um, uh, started with the, oh, and I think I got the Lexco date wrong, actually. That's 2021 that they bought Lexco. I'm looking at my notes, and I shouldn't have done that because I was scribbling my notes in a hurry. 2011 is when they bought the, um, uh, when they bought the Rossville distillery. So 2021 is when they bought Luxco. I kept thinking when I went to Yellowstone or to uh, Limestone Branch, they weren't talking about MGP at that time. And they weren't. So anyway, 
This is the famous 95.5 rye. So many different whiskeys use this. It's part of the reason why some people get a little tired of the MGP brand because they're like, everybody's using a lot of the same juice. Well, for a long time, they only had a couple of different mash bills, but they've expanded that some, and now they have these other facilities as well. So anyway, that's a deep dive into MGP. So now you are in the know. When somebody says something about MGP, you're like, oh, Rossville Distillery. Yeah, okay, I, I know why they have a Rossville brand now. George Remus, okay, I understand the connection now with George Remus, all in an effort to make us just a little bit smarter in terms of whiskey. And now you know when you see Penelope that that also is a brand that was started on its own but is now coming back to the distillery where the juice came from. So, hope you enjoyed this. If you did, please let me know below. Tell me that you enjoy these just kind of history deep dives as well as me jumping in and doing tastings as well. Because this channel is all about feeding some history in there as well as doing the tastings as well. And until next time, cheers! And slow. I don't know if they're ever, if they're bringing the rye in house, but their stuff is aged long enough now at the James E. Pepper Distillery that uh, uh, it, it should hopefully at this point they are putting out some of their own juice. Cheers.